All right, hello everybody. So it's gonna be a little bit before we get started. We're just kind of waiting for uh, people to trickle in. But today we're gonna to be kind of rebuilding a, a Twitter bot that I've built in the past using AWS SageMaker. And this is kind of to go along with kind of this, this dev day summit that we're doing. Um, it's gonna be a lot of fun, and I'm just kind of killing a few more minutes here while uh, while we wait for people to join in. Uh, feel free to shoot me a message in the chat. Feel free to follow me on Twitter. Uh, just kind of waiting for more people to come in. There's a, and uh, somebody asked, what is a summit? That's a great question, actually. Um, there is this kind of like AWS Innovation Summit, Um, let me see if I can find it here. It's kind of like this online, uh, this? Yeah, let me just find it in my email really fast. So in Korea and in basically all of Asia, we have this kind of innovative virtual summit running today. Uh, and I'll send you guys the URL now. I still don't really have a Slack group set up, sorry. Um, I could probably do that though. Let me, let me take that as an action item. Um, I'm just going to update our title really fast. Uh, again, we're just waiting a couple more minutes for people to join in. What should the title be today? There we go. Um, yeah, and I've got a new lighting set up. I've uh, got a couple other things that have been happening. Again, we're just waiting for some people to drop in. Uh, but I'll show you now kind of what we're trying to build. Um, and it's already running in production, so I've built it once before, which is not like most of my normal streams. Uh, typically, we build it from scratch. Um, but there's this robot, or this bot here, my uh, internet will work where you can tweet at it uh, a picture and it will guess where in the world that picture is um, so I have no idea where this is that looks a little bit like Heathrow um, or Charles de Gaulle yeah it looks a lot like Charles de Gaulle actually and uh, hey Rubble Raptor 2000 welcome and basically you know you tweet some picture um, da, 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 da. We'll wait about two more minutes and then we'll get started, everybody. Uh, so we could say, you know, what's a pretty place? Uh, Playa Vista, California. Um, And yeah, I'll just do this. We'll grab this um, this here image. Save image as. Oops. We'll tweet it out. And we'll say, hey, at where ML, where is this picture? Um, and it'll probably get it wrong. It's not the uh, energy drink, I know. It's been a, it's been a long day. I, I started this morning in Boston at 6 a.m. after flying to Boston yesterday. So the energy level will go up in just a little bit, I promise. We're, we're gonna get there. 
<sighs> Again, we're just waiting maybe one more minute for people to join in and then we'll get going. Um, but you can see, you know, I tweeted this out. Then if we refresh the page, hopefully it'll say, well, it said Santa Monica, California for most of the guesses, which is pretty, pretty close to where, where I am. So not a bad guess. Uh, and that's what we're going to attempt to build. And I will talk kind of at length about how it all works. But one of the things that I'd like to do is uh, people have told me in the past that they don't fully kind of grok how machine learning works and what it is. So I thought we'd start with a much simpler uh, kind of example where we basically take uh, the handwritten digits data set. This is often called MNIST. And we will kind of build that to recognize handwritten digits and stuff. Um, pretty straightforward. You've probably seen this tutorial before, but we'll do it with SageMaker in the Python SDK. And from there, I will kind of use that to explain exactly how certain aspects of machine learning work. Um, because a lot of times you hear these words like Terrace or, or um, TensorFlow or Keras or Cafe or um, hidden layers and neurons and LSTM and ReLU and Sigmoid. And all of these things are just kind of vocabulary that are useful to have when you're building out this sort of mental mental schema for evaluating different uh different kind of models and stuff like that but you don't necessarily need to know what all of those things are in order to have a good appreciation for how machine learning works uh so my goal today is kind of to to give you that appreciation so let's go ahead and hop over to aws SageMaker. Uh, and what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to create a notebook instance. Um, I'm going to close out of this tab very quickly. Pardon me. Yeah, the energy level is a little, tiny little bit lower today just because we've been on the go, on the run. Um, so I created a, a notebook and you know, this is really straightforward. I basically just go over to create notebook instance and I can select the instance size. Uh, I select the execution role. I can select if I want it to run in a VPC. By running within a VPC, I would be able to access kind of data that's not normally publicly available. Um, I don't actually need to do that because I'm not gonna be pulling from any of those. And I've already got a notebook instance that's running on a uh, P2X large, uh, which is pretty hefty instance. Um, it's got a lot of power. And I'll click over into sample notebooks. Um, and there are two different things that we will look at today. We will look at the SageMaker Python SDK and I will show you the, uh, oops, sorry, this is the one I wanted. Uh, and we will look at some of the built-in SageMaker algorithms. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna look at just basic MNIST. Um, and basic MNIST kind of works like this. Um, you take this uh, data set of handwritten digits, and these are uh, tens of thousands of pictures of handwritten digits, and you say, you know, these 28 by 28 pixel images, I wanna learn to recognize any other handwritten digit from these. Um, and you're not just memorizing these pictures, which is an important point. You're actually training a network to recognize these digits, uh, a, a very simple neural network. And I'll show you what that neural network looks like right now. Uh, this build graph section is what's going to actually define the topology of how our neural network will look. So if you see what the input is, we're creating um, a variable data. We're flattening that out. Um, so that's taking that 28 by 28 and kind of spreading it into 700 and however many pixels. And then we're creating a fully connected layer of 128 nodes. Then we're doing another fully connected layer of 64 nodes. So we're going 128, 64, and then we're doing another fully connected layer down to 10. And that 10 is going to be the digits 0 through 9. So that last fully connected layer, can you guys see this okay? Do you need me to up the resolution or anything? Uh, that last fully connected layer is kind of what we want our output to be. So we, we kind of define this output function uh, at the end that will force one of these choices. Um, and then we have this kind of training section and all this does is it takes the training data that we have and puts it into a MXNet iterator. Um, well, first it kind of opens it, 
uh, and then it has some 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 stuff for reading from this file. This is kind of like a tightly packed file. Uh, then we reshape it and get it into kind of the format that we want, which is this 28 pixels by 28 pixels. Um, and then a floating type that will have the grayscale value of how active each one of those pixels is. Pardon me. So we do all of that. Um, and then we kind of go into this section over here uh, where we create an iterator for our training data. We create an iterator for our validation data. And to do this split, we're basically just taking 80% uh, of the data as the training data, and then the remaining 20% of the data as the validation data. And the reason we do this is we want to make sure that the underlying data has, uh, you, you know, that it's not just memorized how to recognize our existing data. We wanted to actually be able to recognize data that it's never seen before. Um, then we basically create a module based on that graph. Um, so we pass in this uh, kind of chain that we've defined where each successive layer returns um, what we're looking for. And then we train um, with the context of a GPU or a CPU. In this case, even though there is a GPU uh, on this machine, uh, it's actually more efficient to train on the CPU. And that's because the data set is small enough that the overhead of like sending all of this data off to the GPU to be processed is actually greater than just running it on the CPU. So we'll probably keep this on the CPU. And then we basically just call fit. And we pass in our, uh, our training, our eval. We define an optimizer. Um, this is SGD. We could also do Atom. Um, optimizers are just sort of like uh, stochiastic gradient descent. Um, then we have a learning rate. And the learning rate is saying how fast we're going to be making our changes. We have an evaluation metric. And we have kind of this uh, speedometer that tells us how fast we're going. And we're going to go for 25 epochs. And then Sing20 asks, hi, Randall, how did we come to the number of layers 128 and 64? Well, that's a great question. And I think, you know, you, you don't necessarily need to use those numbers. I mean, we could, we could change this. It's fully within our view to, to make this, you know, 16 by 16. Um, the kind of goal typically, and this is not always true, is to kind of figure out what you want your output to be. Uh, in this case, the digits 0 through 10, or 0 through 9. So that I know I'm going to have kind of nine neurons at the end that I want to be able to choose between. And then kind of work backwards from there to successively larger layers that kind of activate uh, as often as possible. So there's this guy named 3 Blue 1 Brown, or Grant Sanderson who has a series of videos. Um, and I'll just show you one of these animations now. Um, it's actually quite useful for kind of understanding, oops, understanding how this works. Um, opening files is a little harder than I expected. Why is this not working? Um, so Grant Sanderson made these, I didn't make them. Uh, but if you think about your 28 pixels by 28 pixels, and I'm just going to turn off this little image here because I don't think it's particularly helpful. Um, what will happen is those neurons, we're going to go down into uh, our first layer, which is in this case, 16 neurons. Uh, and, and in the case that we were doing, I made 128 neurons. Um, so from 784 to 16, and then another 16, and then down into 10. Um, and so we basically have these, these 13,000 or so dimensions uh, and, and different kind of things that we're changing around and adjusting and uh, learning how a network is, is kind of working is how you uh, basically adjust these weights and biases and uh, functions. Um, and is this video available publicly? I, strongly believe it is, but if you are interested in this stuff and you're looking for someone who is an expert, um, 3blue1brown YouTube has an amazing series on uh, neural networks and deep learning. So I will paste this in the channel now. 
Um, I strongly, strongly recommend this, uh, this series. It's just really, really useful. Um, and I, I was um, able to get a lot of Grant's um, animations because he's very kind and he just wants to teach people. So he, he gives away the animations and stuff uh, to anybody. So in this case, going straight from 784 to uh, 16 is probably not the best way forward. We kind of want to go to a, a, a smaller order of magnitude at first. And then we could go, you know, one more power of two down. Um, but these numbers are somewhat arbitrarily chosen. Uh, so if you guys have a recommendation that you'd like to try out, the, the 128 to 64 is, is what I was going to use. Um, where we get successively smaller, but we could do 128 to 128, or we could do 128 to 16, uh, or 32. You know, we don't have to necessarily go straight to 64. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just, you know, redefine this now. Um, this will give us a new graph. Um, so I saved that. Sorry, I'm trying to find this. Uh, here we go. So uh, in this case, I've got this kind of uh, MNIST file. That's the kind of training thing that we just built. And typically, you know, when you're writing these kinds of functions, you have to guess sort of at what the the best hyperparameters are, and your hyperparameters are things like your learning rate and um, even your batch size or the, the optimizer that you're using, all those sorts of things. But uh, in this particular case, uh, SageMaker actually has something called hyperparameter optimization, where it will go and kind of tune things and try things out for you. Uh, I'm not going to be talking too much about that today, just because of uh, time constraints. But you can see, you know, this is the file. I've basically defined this training interface, this method train, which takes the input, the hyperparameters, the number of hosts, the number of CPUs, and the number of GPUs. Uh, really, really straightforward kind of interface. And you can train any kind of model using that same interface in the Python SDK. So what we'll do now is from sagemaker.mxnet, I will import mxnet. Then I have this mnist estimator that I'm defining. And all this is, is I'm just defining the entry point of this code to be this mnist.py file, which has that train method defined. I'm taking the role, which is my current executing role for this uh, IPython notebook. I'm defining an output path, and that output path we defined up here at the top, which is just ran hunt dash code slash artifacts. Uh, the number of instances that I'm going to train on is one. I'm going to train on an ml m4x large, and I'm going to have a learning rate of 0.1. Uh, so I can run that. And then I just say, uh, grab this sample data from this location, and I'm passing in the training data and then the validation data. And this will run. And if we hop over into the SageMaker uh, jobs board here, you can see that this is running. You can see that we just created this job. Um, and this is, you know, it, it has what the training image that we're using is. It has the, um, the URI to our training data, the URI to our test data, uh, and then it has various other kind of components that might be relevant for us to know about. Um, and you can access KMS data, you, or KMS encrypted data, you can access uh, all kinds of stuff. And while I am using the SageMaker IPython notebook to run all this, you can actually run this locally as well. So you don't need to be in this particular notebook in order to be able to access a lot of the functionality. Um, and then the next thing that we can do, uh, because SageMaker is kind of compri comprises three different parts. It has these notebook instances that you use to kind of develop your models. It has the uh, jobs portion, which is what we're doing right now, where we're training a job. So you can see over here, it's one completed, two created, one running. And then it has the models portion. And the models portion is really just an artifact. Uh, it is the, the JSON or parameter files or whatever it is is used to define your model that you can then launch into an endpoint. Uh, and, and this is typically just a, a pointer to a location in S3. That's where your model files are kept. And the endpoint is the really, really cool part for me because it basically says, uh, I want to have an HTTPS endpoint 
that is auto scaling and hosted for me that will go and uh, allow me to post arbitrary things at it and get results. Uh, I think that's a pretty powerful um, paradigm. It's, it's an interesting way of, of going about building stuff. But before we get too much further, uh, I'll show you two more videos from Grant. Um, and the first one, sorry, it's really hard to get things on my second screen here. So can you guys see okay? Okay. So a neuron is not just a thing that holds number. A neuron, if you think about it, is actually the result of a bunch of different functions. Uh, and the collection of those functions, uh, or, or it's the result of a function, which is really the result of a bunch of different inputs. Uh, so let's say we take this, this number eight, and we want to apply all of the weights that we have with you know, whatever biases they have, and we wanna see which one of these neurons uh, kind of acts up. Uh, and Honey, three, zero, three, one, nine, 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 one. Um, if you're born in 91, me too. It's a good year. Um, you can actually, uh, you asked, or he or she asked if we can change the learning rates to some other number. You absolutely can. We could change it to 0 0.01 or we could change it to 0.2. Uh, the 0.1 is kind of what I, I start with typically in, in any model that I'm building just because uh, it, it should converge relatively quickly. Uh, and you can kind of determine what these things should look like. Um, if you have like randomly unstructured data, the, the line of learning will kind of just very gradually tend down, trend down. But the line of learning, if you have structured data and the network is actually learning, it should have a very sharp and immediate um, trend downwards uh, and then kind of level out for a while. Um, but yeah, so you guys get that, I think. Um, and I think this is almost done. Not quite, sorry. Um, but check this out. Um, I think you can kind of start to visualize how these networks work, right? Like if we were to break it down, we could say, okay, well, an, an eight is made up out of a loop on the top and a loop on the bottom. So now I need to learn, I need to teach my network to recognize loops. Uh, so maybe that first set of 128 is recognizing little edges. It's recognizing, you know, sets of pixels. And then that second layer is recognizing loops. And that last layer is combining the loops and lines and deciding which digit it is. Um, and that would be kind of good intuition. Um, unfortunately, that's not what typically happens. Like we could feed this thing a QR code and it would very confidently tell us that that is a number five. Um, so machine learning is a little bit different than what your uh, typical mental model for, for evaluating these things is. Um, so I'll show you one more video. Um, this is again from Grant, and I think these are really, really useful, so I strongly recommend you go check out his channel because um, he does a much better job of explaining all of this than I do. Um, so this is what I was just saying is like, maybe this first layer is for recognizing, you know, itty bitty edges, little pieces uh, of pixels that are activating here. Uh, and then that second layer could be for recognizing loops. Um, but that isn't really how it works. Um, so libai0915 asked, does SageMaker support R deployments? Uh, no, not to my knowledge. Um, it, it's basically Conda. So anything that you can put into, you know, one of these kernels uh, should work. So uh, we have PySpark. Oh yeah, so Spark R. So definitely, um, sorry, let me put this back on. I did not mean to restart this, crap. Um, so yeah, you could create a new notebook um, in Spark R and Boom, you have R. Um, I don't know R very well, so I'm not going to even attempt to uh, show you how it works. But yes, apparently we support R. Um, I really hope this doesn't completely break since I changed the kernel halfway through. Um, so hopefully this will be done shortly. But 
The really kind of powerful component of SageMaker for me, as I said earlier, are these endpoints. So I can take um, kind of any of my existing models. So in this case, I have my predict places model, and this is actually built on the Berkeley Multimedia Commons dataset. So this is one of the public data sets that we host. Oh. Uh, and I'll paste this in the chat. So this is one of the uh, public data sets that we host. And there's a paper that a group of students from Berkeley uh, wrote about taking all the 100 million or so images from Flickr that are in this data set and taking the geotag data from them, splitting the earth into a grid, and then applying or, or training a network to learn where on that grid uh, these images were. And they applied a bunch of different kind of analyses where they split the data in different ways and uh, they split the earth in different ways to try and train the network really, really well. Um, and they did a really cool job. And you can read the whole paper, Berkeley Multimedia Commons GitHub. Sorry. You can read the whole paper uh, over here. And you can actually download the model uh, very easily. So, you know, these are the symbols and parameters, and these are basically the weights and various components of that uh, whole trained model on 100 million images. And it comes down to only a, a couple hundred megs of data to run this, this whole kind of thing. So there's this predict places notebook. Um, hopefully this will load on GitHub. It may not. Sorry, I'm just, This is not the right one. Waiting for this to load. Yeah, this is the right one. Um, and you can see we get these kind of results. Now, a lot of times you don't need uh, this kind of training component. If we go back, you don't really need this training jobs component or this model hosting component. But what you are interested in is these endpoints. And that was the case for me as well. So I had this model from uh, the super intelligent folks over at Berkeley and I wanted to host it on SageMaker so I could get my auto scaling and kind of AB test different versions of it um, and have multiple models at once uh, in service. And I will show you how you can do that. You will basically define a Docker container that responds to port 8080 uh, on an empty request. It returns another empty request with a 200 OK uh, HTTP response. Uh, if you hit slash invocations as a post request, it can take whatever you can fit in the body of that post request. I think there's limits around it, like five megs is the, the maximum post size. Um, whatever you can throw into that section, uh, and then you can return whatever data you want as well. So you could actually uh, return protobufs if that's more efficient for your kind of response request scenario. Or if you wanted to return plain text, you could do that. You don't have to stick to JSON or anything. It's really just, you can write a Flask app or a Go app or uh, a Java app that can run and, and invoke all of these endpoints. Now, there are a couple convenience features that are in this. Uh, chief among those are that it will auto load the model from S3 for you and mount it at like slash op slash ML slash model or something like that. Um, but those are all pretty straightforward. How are we doing here? Still training. So um, are you guys ready to try running this, uh, this model ourselves? You know, taking an existing model and, and running with it? Or do you want to see this MNIST model finish first? All 
I'll show you one other kind of cool component of uh, SageMaker, uh, and we won't actually run this one, but we have this uh, data set that we're interested in here, this MNIST one, and rather than defining that whole training interface uh, in MNIST.py that I did earlier, I can actually just use the linear learner algorithm that's built into SageMaker, and I can run that. Um, so basically I just say, you know, use this one, one of these containers, depending on my region, and then, you know, set the hyperparameters, uh, and then just call fit. And that will use a pre-existing optimized for AWS, uh, algorithm that's, pardon me, kind of written from scratch, uh, to run specifically on SageMaker. Um, but we won't really go into that. That's actually, uh, I think there's something like 16 different um, Amazon algorithms available now. Um, so this isn't even all of them. This is just a few of them. Uh, and you can find more up-to-date stuff on the sample notebooks page. Okie dokie. So uh, I think we'll start running this whole uh, shindig for the, for the, um, the wear ML bot. Cause this other thing is not finishing yet. <laughs> I was kind of hoping I would be able to kill enough time that this would finish and then I could show you it running, but it doesn't look like we're going to be that lucky today. So, um, let's create a new directory. Um, and I'm going to call this directory Oops, what is going on? I'm gonna call this directory whatever you guys want. So uh, the first person to shout out something in the Twitch chat, I will name the, the new bot that we are building after you or whatever you shout out. So go ahead. Um, uh, Kappa is not an acceptable name. Krish, okay, we're gonna call it Krish. Um, so we're going to go into Krish and we're basically going to say, uh, I want to make a all syntax errors. I would absolutely name something after you, um, because <laughs> unfortunately everything is a syntax error. Uh, okay. So we're going to have a app app.py, um, and this is just going to be a Flask app, a really, really basic Flask app. Um, and I'm going to use Python 3 um, just because that's what I'm used to. Um, but I will future proof it. And we're going to say Flask. And we're basically just going to say, you know, app equals Flask dot Flask Krish uh, logger. I don't really need a logger yet. Um, but we're going to create two routes, app.route. Uh, slash ping, and this is just going to be really, really simple. It's just going to return two, three, four, return two hundred, or return empty response two hundred, um, and this will return two hundred OK empty response. Um, all right, and then we need another thing, and this is where all of the the magic will happen. And this is going to be called invocations, invocations. And the, the, the interface that we are kind of working on here is well-defined and you can check it out in the AWS docs. Um, but basically what we want to do is we want to have, you know, the model loaded from somewhere, um, could be here and I'll just do some stuff locally for now. So, uh, one, two, three, four, and app dot run. Um, and I want this to run on zero to zero to zero, um, and not local host. I'll say debug equals true and port equals 80, 80. Um, and then we'll just say Python app dot pi. Um, and then in another tab, I will just go uh, curl local 0.0.0, .0, .0 or 
say curl local host 8080 slash ping. Um, and I think if we want curl to show the response, we have to be like curl dash i. Yeah, so we got a 200 okay um, response. And then Rock Kento asks, um, yes, the default methods is get honey. Um, I, I'm just gonna call you 1991 because saying honey is a little strange um, in English. Uh, so ROTG Kento, um, what exactly is an AI powered Twitter bot? So if you go to twitter.com slash where ML, basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to use the pixels in an image to guess where in the world uh, something is and then kind of respond back. Uh, in the interest of time, I am going to speed up just a little bit here. Uh, I was trying to go a little bit slower earlier, but um, unfortunately, we don't have too much time anymore. So um, there's this whole app.py section. Uh, but then we also need to have a Docker file. And this Docker file is going to define how we uh, basically interact with um, our, our function. So I'm not a Docker expert. So I'm going to look up like what the minimum kind of minimum flask app Docker thing is. Um, and I, we're just going to follow that tutorial. Um, so it looks like the easiest way to do this is Docker file. The easiest way to do this is from Ubuntu, oops, from Ubuntu, Ubuntu latest um, run apt get update dash y run apt get install dash y python. This looks really old. I don't think this is right. Wonder if this one's easier. Minimalistic. You know what? Um, I'm actually because I don't want to figure out how to install um, MXNet and all of this other stuff. Even though I know it's quite large, uh, I am going to use a different base image. Um, so I'm going to call this base image, uh, or I, I know what this base at, net image is. It's Python latest. Hi, Labop. Welcome. And then we're going to say, oops, we're going to have a working directory work dir of slash app. And we're going to have to run a few commands. We're going to say pip install dash u, um, flask, um, that might be all we need. No, we're going to need scikit image to kind of transform the images. Uh, we might need some other stuff too, but that'll do for now. Um, then we're going to say copy all the .py files into slash app. Uh, and then we want to uh, actually keep the models where they are. So if I go and I look, um, stage maker, bring your own algorithm, it will tell me where I can expect to find the model files. So I will look there briefly, Docker. Oops, this is not right. Um, using your own inference code. And this should tell me where the uh, image is kept. So slash op slash ML model um, is the location that the model will be in. Uh, and so from there, we're just going to define an entry point. Entry point of Python app.py, uh, and then we'll expose port 8080. 
Um, so I think I can just say docker run serve or no. Do I need to name this? Context must be a directory. It's very obvious I don't actually know how to build anything with Docker. So I'm gonna I'm gonna name this Docker um, Krish. Docker build dash t Krish. So maybe I need to make a new directory. I, I'm so confused. Docker build dot. Oh, and I should probably be running Docker locally. Um, so that'll take just a second to start up. Starting, starting, starting. Thanks. So we're gonna call it, we will name this after our uh, fearless leader, Krish, docker build dash t Krish dot. Come on, sorry, docker is still starting here. So it will take just a moment. Um. Are there any questions before I keep going? Okay, there we go. No questions, all right. Um, so basically we're just building this image and then we'll put it into ECR, which is the Elastic Container Registry, and then we will tell our SageMaker endpoint to pull from that. Um, and then we'll get over into the Twitter side of things, which is very exciting and fun. Uh, Guru Desu, I'll, I'll update you briefly. So what happens is we are using uh, Amazon SageMaker. Uh, we are using the endpoints section of Amazon SageMaker. And what that does is it allows us to take a Docker container that responds to ping and responds to uh, slash invocations and basically run an auto-scaling machine learning inference thing. And we're gonna host a, a model that was trained on the Berkeley Multimedia Commons data set of 100 million Flickr, geotagged Flickr images. And we will, what is this found existing installation? Huh. That must be like a conflict between MXNet and Scikit image. Uh, anyway, uh, we will use that endpoint to have people who tweet uh, an image at us uh, basically respond uh, with where in the world it thinks that image is. So pretty straightforward. A um, couple moving parts that are a little complex, but I'm confident that we can work through them here. Um, so. I'm gonna create another file called predict.py. And this is kind of where all of the real stuff will happen. Will happen. This is where our machine learning section will happen. Uh, import mxnet as mx. I'll import numpy as np. And I have actually coded this before, so I, I kind of know what I'm doing, but I'm not like uh, word for word copying things here. So what we want to do is we want to do arg params. We want to create symbols, arg params, and then auxiliary params. Um, mxnet model.load checkpoint. Um, and we're going to need import OS. OS. Um, we're going to create a little file here. os.path.expand. We don't actually need that, do we? Um, so we could probably go and just say slash opt ml model 
Um, and this is going to be the RN101 5K500. And the reason that I know that is if we go back to github.com and we look at tutorials, you can see what the name of the model is right here. So um, we'll do that. Um, you probably don't know the answer to this, but does AWS have a thing to give schools money or something to allow students to learn AWS stuff without worrying about money as much? And ROTG Kento, um, yeah, we do have a, a number of programs. It's through a program called AWS Educate. So you can Google AWS Educate and learn about that. Um, it's both for K through 12 and for collegiate programs. Uh, but also if you have something that you wanna build, uh, I'm more than happy to provide you with AWS credits. I mean, my email address is really easy. It's just randhunt at amazon.com. Um, anybody is welcome to kind of email me anytime they want. Um, so uh, I have no problem sharing my email address. I have no problem with anybody reaching out to me. I'll put it in the chat. Um, and then there are a number of other resources as well. Um, just, you know, kind of let me know what you want to build, what you want to do, and I, I can kind of help you out from there. Okay, so we want to uh, load in this model. And so we're going to say model path. Uh, and then we're going to say, I want to load in that 12th layer. Um, and then we're going to create a module. And a module is kind of like a kernel in, um, uh, in, uh, in MXNet. So we say MXNet mod dot module uh, symbol equals sim and context equals um, mx.cpu. Um, we don't want to use GPU for this, even though we might get some benefit. That would benefit would be almost entirely on the training side, uh, and not so much on the on the uh, 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 Let me see if I can fix this briefly. Oh no, you can see my green screen in my dirty office. Um, so, sorry everybody. Just one second here. Uh, it's not awkward at all. Cool. Uh, I have no idea why my camera died. Uh, I think sometimes it overheats and it just does that. Okay, continuing along, <laughs> steadily but surely. Uh, next thing that we wanna do is we wanna bind this module, uh, bind the, the data and the, the kind of the input stuff of this module. Um, so, uh, I'll say mod, actually, is this right? MXNet module, da, 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 da. Yeah, okay, that's good enough. Um, we'll bind, and I already know what the parameter is called, and I already know the dimensions of it. So the input images that we're expecting are gonna be um, kind of RGB uh, 224 pixels by 224 pixels. Um, and then we're gonna close that tuple out, and then we're gonna say for training equals false because we're not actually trying to continue training this. Um, cool. Uh, and then we need to set some parameters. Set param. I don't remember if this is set parameters or to look this up really fast. MXNet set parameters. There's a really good MXNet kind of cheat sheet set uh, set params, set params, um, arg param, params that we had up there, aux params, and allow missing equals true. Okay, um, and then we need to basically create something that will uh, allow us to shift the, the color scheme of all of our different images um, and kind of bring out 
uh, our stuff here. Uh, and this is just going to be based on the, again, the tutorial that they had here. Um, mean RGB. So I'm really just taking the values from here um, and running those again. Um, yep. Okay. And then we're going to create a batch. Um, and this is going to be a named tuple, sorry, named tuple. Spelling is the hardest part of programming, to be honest. Batch. Um, I'm, I'm actually just going to call this batch. Um, batch, and we're going to use the parameter data. Cool. And then we have grids, and this is again just kind of taken directly from these guys. Um, now, this is a file I will actually have to copy over in the Docker file. So, um, Let's uh, let's find this grids file really fast. Um, I actually know where I have this. Downloads SageMaker models grids.txt. Nope. SageMaker grids.txt. Okay. Um, so let me also, in the Docker file, make sure that we're copying that over. Um, so copy grids.txt into slash app. And uh, where are we in predict.py? Predict.py. Um, so we'll say grids is going to be... Um, I mean, again, we can just sort of open this directly from, from here. We can kind of just take the whole thing. Uh, we don't even need this ground truth section. Um, so we really just need this. And Honey303 asks, is there an online tutorial to learn the basics of machine learning? Uh, we did a series with Sunil Maya uh, earlier this year where we walked through the basics of machine learning and that's actually how I learned machine learning as Sunil taught me. Um, obviously I am not a very good student, but uh, I would strongly recommend checking out the Grant Sanderson videos that I referenced earlier. Um, I'll paste those in the chat now. Um, I think that's it. Um, so this is like, what is a neural network? How does it work? Da, 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 da. Um, really, really great video. It's, uh, taught me a lot. Um, but basically we'll get back to, to building this just in the interest of time. Uh, next thing that we want to do is we want to actually like define some stuff to download the images. Um, so we'll say, we'll create a method. We'll call it download image, image, um, and then we'll give it a URL. And uh, I don't even think we need this anymore. I think this finally finished, by the way. Oh, no. Well, because we changed the channel, or because we changed the kernel that we were running, um, we don't have reference to any of the stuff anymore. So I'm just going to close that. Uh, and you can imagine that the MXNet section worked. Um, okay, so we're going to do download image, and this, we're just going to open a file descriptor, URL lib. Uh, have I imported URL lib? I don't think I have. Um, import URL lib. Um, and then I didn't import name tuple either, so uh, from collections import named tuple. Um, so we're going to create a file descriptor here, URL open, URL, and we're going to open it in, uh, in scikit, call plugin, 
in read fd plugin equals Python image library. Um, so that's what that pill stands for. Uh, and then we want to return that image file. Okay, so we have downloaded the image and then we need to do some pre-processing, pre-process image. Um, and again, I can take almost all of the pre-processing code from over here. Um, it's not quite the same. Uh, in the interest of time, I am just going to use uh, something that I've already prepared. Um, so we'll delete all that and post it in. So you can see it's roughly the same kind of pre-processing that they were doing over for the Berkeley Multimedia one, but we are slightly changing it. Um, and then we get to the predict method, and this is where the fun kind of happens. So the predict method will take an image and it will take a max number of predictions um, because we, we don't always want to generate the same number. And basically we have our module and we're going to call forward. We're going to create a batch um, and it's train equals false. Um, now, I don't know if I need to provide is train equals false on the mod forward, considering that we bound the module without training um, up above. But so over here, when we did mod.bind, that was without training, but I guess uh, we'll leave it that way. Um, and this is all using the MXNet framework, by the way. Um, so then we're going to have a probability, which is going to be, you know, the mod get outputs, get outputs. Um, and then I already know kind of what the shape of this data is as NumPy. Um, and then get that first layer. And then we have prediction. And this is, again, quite similar to what you're seeing over here in the predict and evaluate section, um, but slightly modified. Um, prediction is going to be np.arg sort probability. Um, and we're going to reverse that list. Da -da -da -da. And then we're going to have our result array. And that result array is going to say for i in range max predictions. predictions. Um, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Um, oh, that's not a bad idea, actually. The drop system where you slowly earn AWS credits for watching. That's really not a bad idea. Uh, you know, I could, I could build that. We could build that in another Twitch session. Um, OK, cool. So we're going to say for i in range of max predictions, um, we want the predicted location, uh, uh, grids, and that's that grid thing that we defined up above. Um, can you guys see OK? Should I, should I scroll this further to the top, or you guys can, can see it all just fine? Uh, we're going to say prediction i, kind of close that out. Before. Um, and then we're going to have results is going to be i plus one prob prediction i, uh, and then the prediction location. Um, and then we're going to do results append results two. Um, so really, like this is just. I don't even need to do this section. Uh, all I really need to do is just return the predicted location. So I could just say um, pred lock. Like that's all I really need to do. Um, and then I do return, oops, return result. Awesome. Um, and then we're just gonna kind of combine those two methods that we wrote into another one called download and predict and predict the URL max predictions equals three. Um, and then the other thing that I'm going to do just so, just so that we can run this locally and test it is I'm going to say, um, uh, I'm going to load this from an environment variable very quickly. So I'm going to say import OS, uh, OS.get env. Um, 
model path. Um, and then I'm going to say models. Uh, and all syntax errors asks if this is a weekly thing. Um, I'm definitely trying to make it a weekly thing, uh, but it isn't yet. So uh, let me let me actually let me split this into two things. So we're gonna say model name equals os .get env model model name. Um, and then I'm going to say the default is RN101, 5K500. Um, and then I'm going to say model path is just going to be this section. Um, and we'll say os.get env model path. There. Um, and this way we can run it locally. We can just kind of override model path to point to um, uh, to point to this sort of stuff. And I think this is everything. I'm pretty sure. Oh, we have to finish our, um, we have to finish our download and predict method. Okay. So we say image equals download image. Oops, sorry. Download image URL. Um, and then we say, uh, image equals, uh, well, we don't even need to do that. We could say, uh, pre-process image. This will put it into the shape and color scale and everything that we need. And then we can say return predict image and then the max predictions. And I'm going to set it to three by default. Okay. Um, and I'm sure, like I am 100% certain this doesn't actually work because I've got a syntax error or something somewhere. Um, so what did we break? Uh, unable to open that model. So what we can do um, is we can say, uh, just to get this working, what did I say it was before? Uh, model, or heck, mkdr slash opt, dir slash p slash opt slash ml slash model. That's weird. Um, Uh, and then I'm going to do sudo chone and hunt dash r slash opt slash ml. Pseudo chone dash r even. Um, and then, then I should have permissions there. Yep, good. So then I will copy the model from my downloads folder um into slash opt slash ml models um great so ls slash la uh, slash opt slash ml model yeah yeah okay so now if i run this it should at least load the stuff Did not find dash symbol.json. Local file system here. So what is it looking for again? Slash op slash ml model. Did I spell it wrong? Don't think I spelled it wrong. Oh, 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 this is why, because I'm only passing in the model path. Um, so what I really need to do is I need to say OS model path plus um, model name. There we go. That should work. Uh, sweet, so it, it worked. We were able to bring it in. Um, let's see, label shapes don't match names specified by label names, empty versus soft max label. That's fine. That's just a warning. Um, we can continue to, uh, to use it. So now I, you know, I can pop open, um, a Python terminal. I can say import predict. It'll load the module up. Um, and then I, somebody messaged me a URL. Um, 
anybody, anybody at all can you don't don't paste it in the full chat just because uh, I can't like unban people fast enough. But let's let's just point in. Uh, let's put in a location. Um, somebody, somebody, give me a, a name of a place where you are uh, or are nearby, if you don't mind sharing. Um, just whisper it to me in Twitch, uh, so you can direct message me. Uh, and you you also asked, can Cloud9 integrate into an AWS Lightsail server for all programming straight onto the server? I want to make something for a school project, but can't use Node on my school laptop. So using Cloud9, I could do it right on my server and not need to download it. Belmont CA, Belmont, California, or Brisbane, Australia, Pune. Um, so I'm just going to take this random picture. Uh, oh, this is a YouTube video. Um, so let's just go with uh, Pune, India. Um, so this is a random image of Pune, I guess. Um, and we're going to copy the image address and we're going to say download, oops, predict dot download and predict. And we're going to pass in this URL. Um, and these are the coordinates that it gave us. So let's put these into Google Maps and see if it was right. Maps. Um, and this is thinking it's in Thailand. So let's try another one. This is the second prediction. Um, I can also have it return confidence values. Um, I'm not currently doing that. This also thinks it's in Thailand. Or no, this is in um, Vietnam. So let's try this last one here. Oof. Not great. Um, so let's change the number of max predictions. Let's say max predictions equals 20. Um, and if anybody knows the latitude and longitude that we are looking for, yeah, it would work better if it looked at the, um, this might be right. In Kuala Lumpur. For some reason, it thinks it's all in Asia. Try one more. And then we're going to have to try another image. Again, this thinks it's in Taiwan. Um, and CDB, CD Bogart um, asks if it will return the same results if given the input twice. It should typically, yes. Um, so let's look and see if there's an 18 in here. 18 dot. Nope, no joy. Um, okay, so that didn't work. That, we can try another image though. Um, we're not limited to that one. Um, and I don't have much time because you guys have the keynote to get to for the Innovate Day. So I've only got about seven more minutes with you before I've got to kind of close out and move on. Um, but I will be streaming again at 11 p.m. tonight. Uh, uh, I think that's kind of for people who are awake in India. So uh, I'll be doing mostly the same demo. We, we might build it slightly differently and we might do something a little different uh, just so I don't get bored. But Anybody wants to try, it, it's 11 p.m. West Coast time. Um, let's try a different image of Pune. This looks like a cool image. This looks like a, this looks pretty good for um, that looks like a, an easily recognizable landmark. So let's try this one. Um, eighteen seventy two. I'm pretty sure this is right. I'm pretty sure this is going to be right on the money. Um, 
That looks like Pune to me. It is not. Um, hmm. Oh, it is. It is. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty cool. Um, that was a random picture from the internet. Uh, you can actually take, you know, random pictures from your camera roll. I'm a little afraid to open my camera roll, like, live on, on Twitch. Let me see if I can do it kind of off screen and see if I can find a, a cool recent picture. Um, Dropbox. Um, I was just in Boston this morning. Um, and basically like any, any picture you want could be sent to this and we can train it, you know, we can teach it, uh, new stuff. So what I do with the Twitter bot, uh, which we unfortunately didn't have time to get to, um, today, uh, is Twitter has two different APIs. It has a streaming API and it has a webhooks based API. The webhooks based API, what you do is you define an API gateway. Uh, and I'll show you what that looks like very briefly. I have five minutes left, and if anybody has questions, now's the time because I, I am going to have to call it quits right at 5 p.m. Um, we have this API gateway, and uh, I think this is the one that I use. And we have uh, this webhook, and what this webhook does is it calls a proxy endpoint, um, which calls a Lambda function. And that Lambda function is able to parse the input from Twitter's webhook, and you can then do various things on it. Um, so uh, basically what we do in the SDK is we call uh, photo three here, sorry. We say SageMaker, uh, and this needs to be, yeah, that's the right region import photo three. Does this need to be bigger? Can you guys see it? We basically just say, create the SageMaker client, and then we say SageMaker.invoke endpoint, um, invoke endpoint, um, and then we can pass in whatever kind of uh, URL we want. Um, or JSON. And we get our response back. Uh, or we don't get a response back. Interesting. Oh. Oh, so this is going to be a equals this and then a dot body, a body dot read. Um, and these are our results as we get, you know, whatever this image was, I, I have no idea what this image was actually, uh, but we can go look at it. <laughs> so somebody sent me a picture of a cat and it very, you know, enthusiastically said that it was in this location. Um, but all we do over in the app, so if we go back to the Docker app, just to, show, to, to tie everything together in the last two minutes here, um, we just kind of import um, this prediction section, import predict, um, and then, sorry, uh, we, we basically just say for this invoke section, um, for, uh, data equals request dot get JSON for S equals true. Um, and then that, that'll say, get this, even if the header data doesn't work. And then we just create a result, predict download and predict. Uh, data URL and and data dot get max predictions. Um, but if that's you know if there is no max predictions in the data, then we just provide a default three. Um, is that all good? I think that's all good. Why is it giving me an issue there? Um, and then we just do return JSONify result and we get our result back and that is how you build uh that that bot did i spell it wrong down a load down a load thank you guys for helping me with my spelling that is actually the hardest part of coding 
Okay, there is a closing keynote that I believe is happening now in the AWS Innovate Day. So thank you all for joining me. I'm gonna return you back to uh, to your regular scheduled conference. I will be back on again later. And uh, Krish, thanks so much for lending your name to our little development today. I will push the code later. All right, guys, thanks so much. It was a lot of fun. Bye.